In this part of the rebuild video we begin with the chronograph bridge and this is assembled from several components. It's quite a complex structure but quite straightforward if you follow the assembly procedure. The first item to be placed is the hammer for resetting the centre seconds and constant running minute recorder and then the operating lever is placed on top of the hammer and this is this consists of a, a thin sheet steel lever with a raised lip to operate the uh, vertical clutch system the spring system on the clutch here I'm lubricating the posts relevant to the reset lever and this part being fitted just now is a damper and this takes up some of the initial shock on pressing the reset to prevent too hard a reset and uh, jarring components within the system. Next to be placed is the actual lever itself and this fits over the post that I greased initially and then connects with the damper and we then add a little bit of grease onto the arm of the damper and fit the shepherd's crook style spring which adds some tension to the damper. Once those components are in place, the cover plate can be fitted and this cover plate is held in place by three screws. These three screws are all different. It's highly, highly important that these are not mixed up and these are put back in their respective places. The first screw is not shouldered, this one that's going in here. The other two are because they fit around uh, moving parts but they are still both different between them. What I tend to do with these is when I strip the chronograph bridge for cleaning is I strip out all the components and I refit this plate with its securing screws and run it through the cleaner like that. Uh, because there's nothing in between there it does clean everything thoroughly and it also just keeps all the screws in place and just makes things a little bit easier during reassembly because it's a matter of removing the three screws, taking the plate off, assembling the components and then replacing them. Here we're fitting the brake for the minute recorder wheel. And as mentioned this is held in place with a shouldered screw. this point I'm just checking that all of the components move freely as they're supposed to the next item to be fitted is the operating lever for the hour recording wheel brake and the screw for this likewise is left in this cover plate Because all of these screws are of a different size, it just makes things so much easier. Now the chronograph bridge is assembled, we can fit the operating lever for the start stop function and this is a long curved spring steel piece with a um, 
a hooked piece that you see here attached to a pivot. It has a slot in it and this slot allows the hooked section to slide up and down rotating the pillar wheel. Here I'm oiling the pivot holes for the escape wheel. As mentioned earlier, or in the previous video rather, there's a small drop of oil placed directly on the hole and then in placing the escape wheel and then placing the bridge on top, the pivots of the escape wheel will carry the oil through. In this section here, apologies for part of my head obscuring that, I'm just adding a little bit of 9010 to the shoulder where the wheel of the chronograph runner fits to the shaft, this section just here, and that ensures free rotation and then a little drop of 9010 onto the shoulder where it passes through the cannon pinion tube. You can see quite clearly the spring and the heart set up there for the vertical clutch system. Uh, much, much simpler than the Seiko setup. And here with the minute recorder wheel, uh, we use a foil or a dial washer underneath the minute recorder wheel to give that a little bit of upward tension and uh, a little bit of 910 on the shoulder where, uh, where it sits and rotates. This hole that I'm pointing to just there is where the operating lever for the hour recorder brake uh, fits through to uh, lock and unlock the brake for the hour recording wheel. And then the chronograph bridge is wiggled into place. This goes on relatively easily, but you do need to take care that the escape wheel is seating correctly. And if it is being a little awkward and doesn't slot in quite neatly, remove it and rotate the pillar wheel by one notch and then try again, as sometimes it's, uh, it's under tension because it's in the um, stop position rather than the run position. And this puts pressure down on the chronograph runner uh, requiring a little bit more downward pressure to seat it than you would normally like. At this point just here, um, it had uh, occurred to me that I hadn't um, shown the oiling of the train wheels on the barrel and train bridge side. And uh, this obviously should have been prior shown prior to fitting the, chrono uh, the chronograph uh, bridge, um, hence being shown here so apologies that's the wrong way around and you can see you've got one of the train wheels underneath the chronograph runner there or on one of the train wheel jewels rather the hearts of the um, the hour wheel the minute recording wheel and the chronograph runner are greased using a piece of pegwood which is charged with grease, the excess wiped away and it's a piece that I keep specifically for this job. I find it the easiest, cleanest and most effective method of, um, of lubricating the hearts of chronograph, chronograph runners and it's the method that I was actually taught uh, which is the main reason that I stick with it. The only times I veer away from that are in cases where you cannot get good access to the heart of the chronograph runner such as the Seiko 6139 models where the heart is actually sandwiched in between several other pieces. In those cases I will just apply a, um, a small drop of D5 with an oiler to the hammer faces or to the heart depending on accessibility.
here we're securing the chronograph bridge with th three chronograph uh, bridge securing screws all of the same length and type and then fitting the last two spring components one for the operating lever the start stop lever and then the hammer spring which fits into the slot next to the escape wheel cap jewel. As mentioned previously, these are all held in place with very small screws and there are quite a lot of small screws on this movement. It's, it is a, it, overall, it's actually an, an incredibly small and compact movement for all of the features that it has and what it does. And especially considering that the automatic works don't add any additional height either. That's fitted in a tiny module that you will see in just a moment. There I'm just testing the start and stop buttons to make sure that everything is doing what it should and at this point I've already fitted the pallets which is a straightforward pallets pallet bridge and oil the faces of the pallet stones with um, with 8415 and then we fit the balance and see if we have a heartbeat Unfortunately we do, it's always a pleasant sight, it's always a very very nice thing to see once you place the balance in and you see it start to swing away like this. I did notice incidentally that there was an initial problem on the fitting of the chronograph bridge and when it was in uh, stopped mode the watch would run but when it was in run mode it wouldn't and this was traced to a lack of end shake on the chronograph runner and the pivot for the top of the chronograph runner is also the screw thread for the oscillating weight and my suspicion is that at some point in the past somebody has put too much downward pressure on this while screwing on the oscillating weight and this has actually closed up the gap and it, it was jamming the chronograph runner so uh, I, um, I had to adjust that using my dueling tool to give a small amount of end shake and allow that to rotate freely and once that was done it, uh, it all moves very very nicely with the chronograph running or still. Here you can see the balance beating away nicely uh, the high beat movement 28,800 VPH and at this point I'm just going to demonstrate the parashock shock system and I'm a big fan of this one it's uh, it's very easy to remove and to fit and to oil the chaton section that I'm lifting out here can be a little fiddly I normally use a piece of rodico to take that out and clean it but once it's cleaned and pegged out, you can just place that back in. And as you can see, that has its own shock spring. And then the cap jewel is actually housed inside of another shock spring. So once you've oiled that, it's very easy to just slot back into place and simple to rotate back into place with just one pair of tweezers. Very, very easy and forgiving shock system. Probably the best of all of the non-fixed shock systems like the Inca block. So I would definitely put this, uh, the Parashock, as a second favourite shock system to work with. Moving on to the dial side, we're reassembling the calendar works. So we have the calendar driving wheel, which is a combination part of plastic and metal. And that's just cleaned with Rodico. Uh, it's not a part I like to put through the cleaning machine because... You can never quite know with some plastics how they will react to cleaning agents. And then just here we're screwing on the star driving wheel for the day change. There you can see the screw that's missing and there you can see uh, a little bundle of screws that I've been searching through to find an appropriate sized one so we can fit that in place and secure this plate correctly. As that would lead to problems down the road if it was left. 
and here I'm just greasing the post for the calendar wheel jumper and then a little bit of lubrication on the point of the jumper where it interacts with the calendar wheel and we can place the disc in place making sure that the jumper spring seats correctly and with the calendar wheel in place we can fit the cover plate which holds it all together this is held by four very tiny screws uh, again very tiny very fiddly very easy to lose so care must be taken here and the cover plate as you will be able to see on your screen has a formed in jumper spring for the day wheel which rides on the day wheel star And here I'm just checking the operation of the quick date change and then the time setting to make sure that that changes over as it should there you can see it moving the day change star after it's just changed the date here I'm using the greased pegwood as mentioned that I use for the hearts of the chronograph wheels to just add a bit of lubrication to the driving star of the day wheel disc before we snap this into place it has its own little spring clip which snaps it onto the hour wheel and keeps it secure and as a final check we're just making sure that both the date and the day advance correctly as they should and there you can see the quick day change feature using the reset pusher The next step is to refit the dial and the dial has a spacer ring which fits around it you'll see that momentarily so we first loosen the two screws which holds it in place this dial is actually an aftermarket one and you can tell quite easily from the front of the dial of this one there are a lot of aftermarket dials for these watches uh, much like the Seiko chronograph models because like those they were relatively cheap watches in their day and tended to be neglected a bit when it came to checking seals for waterproofing and keeping them serviced so many of them suffered with moisture ingress and the dials suffered very very badly as a result as did the hands the dial and the hands on this watch are aftermarket parts so we're now refitting the hands and this is done in the standard procedure where it's um, the time setting is turned until the date flicks over and then the time is set to 12 p.m. I do have a press for the hands but because of this top-down camera angle and limited space I wouldn't have been able to film that so here I'm just pressing them on initially roughly with uh, with the tweezers in the old school method just to demonstrate the whole procedure I, want, I wanted to try and show as much as possible of the entire rebuild um, of this particular watch just because so many people had asked about the rebuild from the previous video so I wanted to try and get something very comprehensive and thorough up there now you'll notice there that I have um, a peg in place which is holding the reset down and this is held in place while I fit and reset 
the chronograph center seconds hand and again like the Seikos these actually have two flats on the chronograph runner which cut into the hand. This is really useful when refitting a used hand that has been fitted correctly because it's very hard to go wrong and misalign it. Um, fitting a brand new hand is a little tricky because it has to be held straight and fitting a used hand that's been fitted incorrectly can be an absolute nightmare much like the Seiko's because if it's been fitted very close to the zero point but not quite on then trying to get it to cut a new path into the tube of the second hand can be really fiddly and similarly here we're setting the hour recorder and minute recorder hands and then just performing a quick test of the chronograph and you'll see here I'm going to move around manually the hands of the minute and hour recorders and then we'll try a reset. And do this two or three times just to make sure I'm absolutely happy with the reset. You'll notice there that the minute recorder, uh, sorry, the hour recorder didn't snap straight back at that point, and that turned out to just be that the movement was uh, a little bit loose in the holder there. So once happy with this, we can look at casing up the watch but first of all just for your viewing pleasure here's a little test run of me leaving the watch running on the bench while I went and grabbed a bite to eat just to check that it uh, it ran and counted accurately up to about an hour or so uh, for the actual proper test after everything's cased up I do like to let these run for 24 hours so they do two full complete cycles of the 12 hour counter dial um, the same applies with any chronograph with a 12 hour counter dial and especially if one has a 24 hour indicator. Once happy with that we can fit the movement ring and you can see the half moon shape there. This ensures that the movement holder ring can only fit on it in one specific orientation. Um, which is very very handy it's um, it's not impossible but it is very very hard to try and get it in the wrong place and you will struggle if you uh, if you force it on in the wrong orientation so with the movement ring in place we can make sure that's firmly seated in the case and insert the crown and stem this should slip in very very easily if it's giving any resistance at all then something is amiss either the movement isn't fully seated or it's off at a bit of an angle and you're trying to force the crown and stem in elsewhere so if it doesn't slip in very very easily then you need to double check before you go ahead and try and force that in With that in place we can reassemble the automatic winding bridge and uh, reversing wheels. So here we have two reversing wheels. One has a, uh, a geared section with a, a long pivot. This fits into the recessed hole with the jewel at the bottom. So a small amount of D5 is applied to the pivot and then this is dropped into place. Same operation with the other one. Both are fitted with the brass wheels uppermost. And it's impossible again to get these in the wrong place. The part where I was just pointing with my tweezers there between the shiny and the dull silver metal section, a very small amount of 9, uh, 9 to 10 is applied there to make sure that that rotates freely and easily. And then the automatic winding bridge is fitted with its two securing screws. And the uppermost pivots are oiled with D5. A point to note regarding 
these movements and the same as the Seiko movements. There are people who will tell you that the old service guides dictate that you should and shouldn't oil certain parts. But what needs to be borne in mind with servicing watches like this in the modern day, these service guides were written initially in the 1970s and were written with the intention that the chronographs would not be running continuously while the watch was in use. Uh, whereas it's been found to be beneficial on watches with a um, with a vertical clutch, a sprung clutch system, it's been proven beneficial to allow them to run continuously so that the spring is not under tension and weakening, which will then allow the uh, hand to slip. So with that borne in mind, some parts that you ordinarily wouldn't oil it's actually more beneficial to apply a small amount of oil to them and completing the automatic winding works we fitted the bushing and the um, the main driving wheel that the oscillating weight drives uh, which we've just screwed in place there as you can see so a quick rotation to make sure that that's rotating smoothly and it's not catching on anything uh, ensure that the bearing is not loose or wobbly and then apply a small amount of D5 to the ball bearings and then just give that a bit of a work around using a blob of Rodico to spin the oscillating weight. At this point I'm going to go ahead and case the movement just to demonstrate the operation of the movement but it will be rough regulated and then put on to test overnight and then it would be fine regulated after a 24 hour period and then left on the winder tester to ensure that it keeps um, respectable time. So here I'm just checking the day date change making sure that that occurs as close to midnight as possible for the date change and then shortly after for the day and then we'll take a look at the chronograph operations so there you could see the flyback reset operation in uh, practice and uh, there is the completed citizen challenge timer 8110A bullhead chronograph I hope you enjoyed this video, I hope it's been useful, thank you for watching and please join us for our next video.